Hello, my name is Ran and this is the Flow Artist Podcast. Every episode we interview inspiring movers, thinkers and teachers about how they find their flow and much, much more. I hope you're having a wonderful day. I'm having a great day myself and the biggest reason for this, the day I record this intro marks three years since my stomach was removed. For me, it's like my second birthday. I remember back to that day three years ago, walking through the threshold to the prep room for surgery. Joe gave me a big hug and said, you got this. It was really what I needed to hear because frankly, I was terrified. Before I was told I needed the surgery, I didn't even know you could live without a stomach. I didn't know what life would be like afterwards. Would I be fragile and sick for the rest of my life? I just didn't know and many of the reports I'd read online didn't really help to ease my anxiety. But here I am now and I'm strong, I'm well and I can still do handstands and other crazy silly pointless things like that. So back to today's episode, this is yet another very important episode for me. It's an interview with Simone Busia and Michelle Lykakapas and I really hope I've pronounced that correctly. Now, these are both amazing individuals who are also living without stomachs. Michelle is an artist, a meditation teacher, a Reiki practitioner, and the main admin and creator of the support group for partial and total gastrectomies on Facebook a group with over 2,000 members that help support individuals and the families of individuals living without stomachs. Simone is a community and corporate fundraising coordinator at Peter McCallum Cancer Foundation, and Peter McCallum is where I received my treatment. She's also a board member for No Stomach for Cancer and the organizer of the local No Stomach for Cancer Walk, which is happening on November the 18th to help raise money for stomach cancer research and stomach cancer awareness. Now, I think this is a great cause to help raise funds for stomach cancer. And as we'll hear, some of the money even goes to local researchers. As we'll also hear, stomach cancer is the fifth most common form of cancer, yet the third most deadly. And this is mainly because it's not detected until too late, unfortunately. So we can really help the cause just by raising awareness. And I'll leave links in our show notes. Now, to help raise funds, Joe and I are running a Yoga for Digestive Ease workshop on Sunday, November the 4th at 2pm at our little studio, Garden of Yoga. In this workshop, you'll learn more about my story, how yoga and meditation helped me, a little bit of information about the digestive system, and we'll be practicing some gentle vinyasa, yin yoga, and meditation. It'll be absolutely fantastic. I hope you can make it. I'll leave links to that in the show notes as well. Okay, now this is definitely enough talking from me. Let's get on to the conversation. Thank you so much for meeting with us today, Simone and Michelle. I'm really glad to be able to speak with you. Could you please just start by telling us a little bit about yourselves and what you do? My name's Simone and I am working at the Peter McCallum Cancer Foundation as a fundraising coordinator. I guess I moved into that path after my experience with stomach cancer a few years ago where my family were diagnosed with a CDH1 gene and as a result had my stomach removed. Hi, Michelle. I'm a Melbourne-based artist and I run workshops and I'm also a Reiki practitioner. And I moved into, obviously, concentrating more on my artwork also after I had my stomach cancer and realised that I couldn't go back and work in a full-time capacity. So I had to start exploring who I was and what I could give back to the world. (laughs) And so was that because you felt like you just didn't have the energy reserves to work a full-time day or is that because you realised that wasn't where your heart was after facing such a huge experience? Probably a little bit of both. My youngest was three years old and he just started three-year-old kinder so I was pretty much just about to start looking at going back into some type of employment when I got sick. So I'd been home for a few years, yeah, and then realised I just I just did not have the energy that I used to have. So, so that's why I started moving into um, what I'm doing now. Would you both like to tell us how your life has changed since your surgery? 
Yeah, so I think similar to what Michelle was saying before, I actually worked in a, a sales sort of high energy corporate environment for a number of years and was quite successful. But for me, after being diagnosed, I had a very different perspective of what life should look like and I was very keen to get out of that world. And so hence moving more into working in fundraising and whatnot. And with my diagnosis, although different to Michelle in that I haven't had stomach cancer, I had my surgery as a preventative measure but it does give you a very different perspective in terms of life in general. So obviously there's a lot of physical changes, but also just mentally and being grateful for the little things each day. Yeah, I'm definitely a lot more conscious about what I eat and when I eat it and my energy levels. Again, I like to use the 12 spoon theory. Uh, I don't know whether you've heard of it. Oh, it's okay. So you can... Google it. It's a lady with, uh, I think it's fibromyalgia, mm. and she's just trying to describe to her friend how it feels for her every day. So that's a good analogy that, that we could use, that if you've got 12 spoons and, you know, getting up, getting dressed, having breakfast, that might use three of your spoons. So you can eat a little into the following day if you need to, but you can't do that constantly, otherwise your body will just crash. So I'm um, being a lot more conscious of my energy, where I put it, people I spend my time with and obviously having to have extra preventative surgery because of my Lynch syndrome which is one of the reasons why I feel that I got my stomach cancer. Would you mind explaining a little bit more about the Lynch because I actually haven't heard of that before. Okay so Lynch syndrome is a genetic it's a genetic risk that it's uh, passed down you've got 50% 50% chance of obviously my father had it. He died of bowel cancer when he was 36. And I have got a high risk of getting any type of sort of gastrointestinal cancers. But Lynch syndrome is like the umbrella where lots of other cancers fall under that. So with a lot of men, they get bowel. Bowel's a big one. And ladies, what tends to happen is it affects their reproductive system and then goes into bowel. So I've had uh, obviously a full hysterectomy and um, I had my ovaries removed as well. And that was pure preventative. But I feel like I've done my bit for ovarian cancer research because I donated blood and my ovaries and all that. And they were perfectly healthy. There was nothing wrong with them. So again, it was a very hard well thought through decision that I that I did to have that done but I waited until my five year mark before I went and did that so yeah unfortunately just one of those things that's ongoing for me too so fix you know bowel ovaries bladder cancers um, melanoma Uh, there's a whole range of uh, pancreatic brain tumor you know the list goes but there's four different genes within the Lynch syndrome gene I've just got one of them but I, I believe that there needs to be more sort of research put into into that knowledge is power yeah absolutely (laughs) so then you can be your own advocate when it comes to your health and and the choices that you make and it seems like you're both really committed to not just being your own advocates but really motivated to help other people be their own advocates as well and kind of like create support networks and get information out to people because I mean with the lynch like I'd never heard of that and imagine how many people are walking around with that combination of genes that just have no idea that these possibilities are out there yeah well I didn't think mine was connected because my dad had bowel my auntie had passed with ovarian my uncle had passed with pancreatic and my great grandmother also or my grandmother passed away but because she passed away that long ago, they didn't. That was when cancer kind of wasn't spoken about. So we don't know what type of cancer she had, but I'm guessing she was the one that had the gene that passed it down to that us on dad's other family. And I had no idea that those genes would be connected to stomach cancer. I just thought I was just unlucky. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, and it's sort of interesting about being your own advocate because definitely during my whole journey you sort of discover that you do have to be your own advocate. You have to sort of keep tabs on everything that's happening. You know, and, and this is a country with a really good health system and a lot of support out there. So I can imagine in some other countries it must be really quite difficult. Yeah, absolutely. Well, especially when genetic testing, you have to pay for it overseas. Right. So I know my cousins overseas, a lot of them haven't done it because they have to pay for their genetic testing, whereas Peter Mac have basically said they will look after 
all my family. Mm. Um, yeah. As far as, you know, even counselling for the kids, if mm. they want to sit down and have a discussion with somebody. And, you know, if you go and get tested and you test positive, then they're there as a support network. And because I've got it, they don't have to pay to get testing done. So. What I've noticed too, actually, the same thing where I've pretty much from the start of my journey, I've been in association with Peter Mac, the Familial Cancer Centre, and then for my surgeries and have never thought twice about going anywhere else. I'm connected to a lot of people in America and a big thing for them is shopping around, so to speak, for the right surgeon mm. and the right area to go and if their insurance covers it and whatnot. And I think, as you're saying, we're really lucky here mm. too not have those sort of stresses yeah like the world leading hospital is a public hospital right exactly that's exactly right and it's interesting now that I work there I can kind of connect those dots so I work in the foundation part there where we raise money specifically for research there but you literally do see it day in day out incredible work that they do we've got over 600 researchers there and they literally take their research to bedside so you know we're so lucky just in this country and Mm. that's not just Peter Mac they collaborate with a lot of other amazing researchers as well so and Peter Mac was where I got my treatment as well so I can also (laughs) speak very highly of them and I love how a lot of the technicians they'd say you know Hope I never see you again. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, I think that's for the right reason. Yeah. <laughs> Just one of those troublesome patients. <laughs> it is possible, yeah. <laughs> Were there any practices such as meditation or journaling that helped you guys get through this whole journey as well? It's interesting. I've never been one to journal. However, when I was first diagnosed with the CDH1 gene, it was something I was compelled to do. So I did start a bit of a journal and it was really helpful for me. And so prior to my surgery, I started journaling, um, I guess, a lot of facts and information, but also in terms of how I was feeling, and it was a great outlet for me. And then I did that pretty much up until 12 months post-surgery. So that was great. And it's actually interesting to read back on that now, seven years post-surgery, and Mm -hmm. just have a look at some of my thoughts and feelings, and also just in terms of my recovery. I think sometimes you get a little bit bogged down in you know, where you're at at the moment, it's good just to look back at how far you've come. Mm. And I suppose the other great thing for me was during that time, I also found the No Stomach for Cancer website where I was reading a lot of blogs and things of people because CDH1 gene is quite rare and you feel somewhat isolated. It's not something, for example, like breast cancer where it's quite, unfortunately, quite common, a lot of resources. And so for me, being able to read what other people had gone through was was quite comforting as well i could imagine as well having not actually had cancer and having the surgery would put you in a bit of a different position to most people who had this surgery who yes people kind of get that like absolutely you're having surgery you're having treatment but um that's right we had to explain to a lot of people what you were doing yeah it's really weird people do look at you as if you're very odd going in for a surgery when you're completely healthy. I actually do recall the day going in for my stomach removal and feeling really fit and healthy and it's quite a surreal feeling. I mean, I felt privileged also because obviously there was other people within the same hospital that were there because they had to be, but that was quite compelling in that sense as well and I've literally gone through the same thing recently having had a double mastectomy but feeling a lot more confident knowing from my, my first surgery that it was the right move. Oh, where do I start with this? <laughs> yeah, I was with a self-development circle prior to getting sick and I like the story. We were doing a goddess workshop and I pulled out Carly and I remember looking at the card and going, holy guacamole <laughs> and Carly is not necessarily a death but physical death but obviously that, that could have well been and I had no idea didn't know what to expect when we started working through that the particular goddess series that I was doing so when I was diagnosed with stomach cancer I took some time away from those classes and then when I was able to go back it was really important for me and I'm a big Carolyn Miss fan that your biography becomes your biology And I really wanted to dig a lot deeper within myself to find why did this happen. So there was a lot of inner work that had to be done. So a lot of meditation, a lot of self-development, just to be able to sort of get to that place where I go, ah, okay. And once you find the source, you can shift it so that there's no recurrence of the disease. So sort of, you know, dig as deep as you can to find that wound and that trauma and be able to let it go 
before it becomes a disease somewhere else in your body. So that's pretty much exploded my pathway of spiritual healing and and the direction that I'm kind of heading in now to be able to assist others, not just in the with the support groups, but also outside of the support groups as well. So with the art workshops, it's just about being able to light that little spark of creativity mm. within people so that they can go, oh, my God, I can actually do this. And, you know, when they had, you know, I can't even draw a stick figure and they come out with like all these beautiful pastels that they just finding that little spark within them that they Mm. didn't even know was there. And also with healing, you know, if you've got the opportunity to lose weight before you have a heart attack or take your backpack off, I was actually listening to Anita Monjani the other day of YouTube that she had and um, she was just discussing about the backpack. You know, people have got the back, well, you know, all your troubles, all your traumas, all your wounds and your backpack. Yeah, Yeah, you've got your backpack on. And you start sort of unpacking your backpack and do that while you're, you're not in a state of disease. You know, find the support systems that you can. And also bringing people that are in a support group back to a place of, because it is really, really traumatic. I mean, you, everyone here knows what it's yeah. like yeah. recovering from surgery. You really feel like it's going to last forever, especially that first 12 months when you're waking up and you're just so nauseous every morning. And, um, you know, trying to get even just the smallest amount of food down is a struggle. Mm. And you don't realise how much socialising goes around food Mm. until you don't have a stomach. And then everybody wants to cater for you and you're like, don't worry about it, I've got two salada biscuits, that's going to do me. (laughs) You know, but everyone feels that they've got to accommodate your your system. You're like, no, don't worry about it. You know, I'm fine, I've got my little snack bag, you know, I can can survive. No, I think my friends aren't as nice as yours. Oh, really? I just think they're lovely. lovely. (laughs) Especially if they're listening right now. (laughs) And um, what you're saying about the support groups and sharing online as well, I know that when Ran was first diagnosed, like first place I went was the internet, and a lot of people do their most sharing when they're going through the hardest times, and then when life kind of goes back to more of a normal rhythm, people are less motivated to kind of vent and share online. Yes. And so when you are going to that group, you see everyone's hardest days and everyone's worst times and you don't get to see as many of the wins of made an amazing painting today or like I think maybe some people even feel like it would be a little bit obnoxious to go oh, everything's going great with me when so many people right. in that group are not in that state of mind so that's something that we're really keen to share that like life goes on and can even get better after a surgery like this. So I guess that's something that I'd like to ask both of you now. Is there something in your life that has really changed for the positive, having been through all of this? I mean, not dying is one. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many things. In fact, I often say to people that in a lot of ways I'm really happy that this happened and I get odd looks from that. But, yeah, I I think that overall perspective of life in general, I think once you're faced with mortality and and whatnot, it just puts so many things into place. And so for me too, I was angry for many years after. My dad died at 56 and I was sort of late 20s and was really upset and didn't understand what was going on and having later found out that actually we had this genetic mutation and now I can look back and think how grateful I mean unfortunately we've lost him but he was able to then save my life and then others in the family's life and so forth so I've been able to get some peace around that from a physical point of view I'm probably the fittest I've ever been in my life and I've been I'm someone who's always hated sport and loved it when it was raining I didn't have to go out and <laughs> do exercise and whatnot whereas now I exercise um, five days a week and I feel really fit and you know, it's a bit of a challenge at the moment recovering from surgery because I'm not able to do that. But just that mental um, fitness and physical fitness is, is incredible in terms of what it does for you day by day. So, it, Did that change because you just had so much more appreciation for your body? Yeah, I think it did. I think, you know, after the initial recovery, I think become very conscious of then eating well and living well. And so for me, I followed the low FODMAPS food diet, which has really helped me with that type of thing. And then I was really keen as I get older, I just want to make sure that I'm the fittest and healthiest being that I can be. And I'm seeing it in my recovery at the moment from my current surgery that it, that's really helping as well. I think going into it being fit and healthy is, makes a huge difference. With me, I'm actually in the middle of reading a book called Conversations with Ralph by Michelle Lightworker. And it's synchronicity, I suppose. Let's call it a synchronicity. That I was out to this page last night when I was reading it. She was talking about 
Louise Hay's life and had she not had her incurable cervical cancer, then she wouldn't have discovered how to heal herself naturally. And then she wouldn't have written the book, You Can Heal Your Life, which has sold, or which has got here, over 35 million copies wow. worldwide. So can you imagine the impact that she has had on the world because of her disease and being able to share her story? Mm. And I would not change my story because I really feel that I'm here to make an impact on people. And had this not happened to me, then I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing. I would have met all these beautiful people (laughs) and made some really nourishing lifelong friendships Mm. and just be able to be that little spark of hope for people that have had that diagnosis or, you know, be there in, in somebody's grief when they're not knowing how to deal with their cancer and how they're going to get through it and what if they don't get through it I wouldn't change anything Mm. yeah yeah I think I'm the same it gives you quite a unique perspective on just even how the medical system works Mm. or just you know it's this part of life that you don't really get to see so I found it was quite an interesting experience I probably did approach it with quite a sense of curiosity at the time I I would not want to do it again if I (laughs) (laughs) if I have the opportunity but no it's definitely an interesting process to go through and Mm. yeah I I think I'm the same I'm sort of glad that I've had this experience you know maybe the podcast and a lot of things I do now came out of that so yeah definitely definitely agree there Public service announcement. (laughs) One thing that really ground my gears when Ryan was in the middle of his um, diagnosis and treatment and everything was how people would tell us how we should be grateful for this chance at life or, you know, he should just be grateful to be alive when he was going through some really tough times. And I think people need to come to that realisation on their own. Mm. Like, I think, you know, eventually you do get to feel grateful. Mm. But I particularly found gratitude practices were not helpful. Yes. Being told I should do gratitude practices were not helpful for me at that time. A lot of people used to say to me, it's a small price to pay to be here for your family. I'm like, no, it's a bloody big price to pay (laughs) to be here for my family. You have no idea. Yeah. 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 Also really interesting that some people find it come. Many people find it come and say, "Wow, you're so lucky that you won't put on weight again." And people feel like they have to add some sort of positivity. In, wow, you're lucky. I wish I had that. And then we have that conversation. Actually, you really I wouldn't don't. wish you not having. Yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah it I is think, interesting, though, isn't it? Mm. I mean, I think I was always really happy when if a friend didn't know what to say to us and felt like they had to say something positive just to tell us that they loved us. Right. Like, I felt like that was always really helpful no matter what we were going through. Yeah, what can I do for you? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just bring me food. Yeah. yeah. Or an extra yeah. pillow. Yeah. 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 Oh, another beautiful friend got a house cleaner for us. That was Fantastic. really amazing. Yes, yeah. yes. Yeah. need one of those. I need one of those now. <laughs> <laughs> Just put it out there. <laughs> what are some of the common assumptions and misconceptions people have about dealing with cancer and living without a stomach? When I was sitting in with a surgeon with my husband and he was explaining where the tumour was and how he was going to remove it, he basically said because of the location, he was going to remove the whole of the stomach because of the issues that could have been created or the recurrence of cancer that could have happened had he removed just the top half of my stomach and left the bottom half. Mm -hmm. And obviously the first question I asked was, like, how do you live without a stomach? I'd never heard of it Mm -hmm. before. I'd heard of people having gastric bypass surgery and or you know lap band surgery that's so that I just kind of assume that they've still got part of their stomach there but how do you actually physically live without a stomach and I think that kind of flaws it people sometimes mm. or if you say I don't have a stomach it's like they don't quite comprehend what you just said mm. yeah that's mm. right I was like, oh. <laughs> and you're like no no I literally yeah. don't have a stomach <laughs> I'm not kidding like yeah, yeah. exactly oh, and, and then when they think it was 
done on purpose. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I just exactly. go, no, because I want this, like, bikini bod all yeah, year round. Yeah, that's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. And then the next question is always, can you eat? How do you eat? Yeah. yeah. How do you eat? Like, no, I, all of a sudden, you, <laughs> <laughs> you go, I just see a video all the time. <laughs> yeah. I do find people, too, sometimes just out of the corner of their eye watching me eat and say, wow, she's doing it. She's eating. <laughs> How's that working? <laughs> Amazing. I think, too, from the cancer question that you asked before, again, going back to my reflection of working at Peter Mac, um, I think a misconception is that cancer is always a death sentence. And unfortunately, it is a very common killer of people. However, what I have, you know, fortunately found out working there as well is it's very treatable um, and a lot of people do have a good diagnosis, but it is about, again, being rigorous in terms of if you're not feeling well, know your own body, get tested. Um, yeah, don't wait. Don't, don't wait. be ignorant to, exactly. to mm-hmm. symptoms. Because there's a lot that they can do. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And don't put off getting tested because you're afraid of the answer. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yes, exactly. That's yeah, right. because the treatment is far worse than the prevention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And if that's already on your mind, the longer you wait, like the longer you're going to be worrying about that and that situation will potentially be getting worse. Yeah. yeah. So where your attention goes, your energy flows. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. yeah. A lot of people ask as well if Ryan has a colostomy bag. Yeah, so that, yeah. 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 Oh, I can ask right. if I've got a bag too. Yeah. It's like, no, no, that's the other end. (laughs) (laughs) Wrong tube. A misconception that I've noticed as well is people are really surprised at how healthy and well Ryan looks now. And you both look really healthy and well as well. I think even like what you're saying with the spoons, people expect you to look frail and you might look totally normal, but still have those issues of having to manage your energy really carefully and being careful about when you eat and things. So I think that sometimes from the outside, it doesn't always indicate what the rest of your life looks like. Yeah, this is, this is kind of the end result. Yeah, well, no one sees you when you're dumping and you've got dumping syndrome and you're, and you're laying on a couch doubled over or, right. you know, when you've, you've got to hang over a chair. I mean, my family, just so used to all the noises that come out of me now that... Yeah. I kind of get ignored. I'm laying on the floor in pain. It's like, anyone just, just <laughs> they're just like, oh, yeah, mum's just whatever. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that kind of happens when you go out, especially I find that if I, I leave it too long in between meals, I don't know how, how you are, I find it really hard to get food down. So I normally have to have, like, a warm drink or something to kind of warm my esophagus up before mm. I get food back in it. And often if we're out, that can be quite difficult. Mm. So you kind of chew on something, and that first mouthful that goes down, you go, oh, man, this is not going to go down. I'm either going to have to go and get it out or yeah. find a drink real quick and people don't see that because mm. I've, I mean I've learned to hide it quite well people probably think oh yeah that skinny chick she's in the toilet again That's but right. it's because uh, you know I have to do what I've got to do when I'm especially out in a social um, environment it is interesting every so often I get that you know oh maybe I shouldn't have swallowed that so quickly <laughs> Just, yeah. you know, that went down like a ton of bricks but um, yeah most of the time it's fine and often my inner pig takes over and says, I'll just finish it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, no, why did you do that? Yeah. <laughs> Busk a pan. Yeah. <laughs> well, I know sometimes Ryan has this like really like weird sensation of like feeling hungry, but at the same time being uncomfortably full. Yes, I have that too, actually. Yeah, it's really odd, isn't it? Yeah. 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 Actually, I've never felt that hunger sensation since. It's interesting, there's varying degrees of some people do feel hunger and others don't feel it at all and I, I have to say I felt an empty feeling but I've never felt that ravenous I mean I do that's probably one thing I really do is that really ravenous hungry feeling mm. that you used to have and woof down a meal yeah I don't feel hungry at all no. either I tend I know when I'm empty because mm. I start I'm starting now this like little burping, burping. Oh, yeah. and I know that I'm, my body's empty so I look at oh because I was overweight on oh, no, it that's okay <laughs> <laughs> just gobbling some strawberry um yeah, I was I was overweight before I had my surgery and I pretty much just like lived to eat. Mm. But now I realise that I, and I look at food so differently now. It's not yeah. even, it's not how much I eat now, it's what I eat. And I love really tasty foods. Mm. So if I'm going to have something, it's got to be like small and tasty. And a friend of mine had a good analogy. It's like, you've just got a little wallet now, so you're only going to put $100 notes in there. Oh, uh, exactly. yeah, like that. That is so right. <laughs> It's interesting, the last couple of weeks I've had some lovely friends do a bit of a meal train for me because I'm recovering. And But, of course, we've been delivered all these beautiful pastas and high carb foods. And I've just felt, because I've been doing low FODMATs, which is very much not that, I felt, and not moving a lot, I've actually felt a bit, 
well, lethargic and stodgy, so I kind of know the way I was and I know I'll get back there. Um, in terms of the exercise and food, it's a massive thing. A lot of our listeners are yoga teachers, mm-hmm. and I'm a yoga teacher, so um, I'd just love to know, say you were walking into a yoga class, is there anything that you'd like the teacher just to know in advance? I guess we'll do it for you personally because it's different for everyone. I've done, oh, you've done a lot more than, than me, Michelle. I've done a little bit of yoga and I did find I got to a point where I was, there was no problems whatsoever, but we did have that moment of going up the other way around and my head was down and I did feel that sensation of yeah, yeah feeling a bit sick or that, that burping thing came along and so... Yeah, that would be something that I'd probably just... And I don't know if there's a way around that. Yeah, around definitely. Like like that. I, mean, you're yeah, kind of I just was always able to invert pretty easily. Like, um, I don't know if our listeners want to hear this, but usually when I come back up, I'm a little fart. <laughs> it's not always cool. It's like, no chance. It's real. <laughs> Yeah, it's great how it's teaching as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe won't demonstrate so much. Yeah, so I, I really do feel like I got off the like, oh, maybe the people around me not so much. So I'm curious, so what sort of exercise have you been doing? So I do a program called Body Fit Training, which I suppose is a bit like that. Um, oh, it's like 45. Yes, that's yeah. right. And I've actually been completely fine with mm-hmm. that. Just mastered the independent chin ups, which was oh, good. good. I'm not sure I'll be doing that for a little while now, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and I've had no problem whatsoever with that. I do actually have had a few moments if I've gone a little bit, I get a little bit dizzy just from overdoing it. I just need to, mm-hmm. but I'm really lucky that I'm one of the people that can drink water easily. Um, I can't gulp it down, but I can drink a lot of water, so I think that's really helpful for me. And I know that's probably challenging for other people that, mm-hmm. that can't necessarily do that. Mm, I struggle. I put uh, some coconut water and milk and that tends to change the consistency of the water and and I can get that down a little bit quicker. But I avoid all cardio, three minutes on the trampolines, (laughs) more than enough for me. (laughs) And as far as yoga, when I first started, I was amazed at how I could manipulate my body. Mm -hmm. I'd done yoga prior to getting sick and obviously being a lot lighter and just being able to to move um and yeah i don't mm. know whether you found that as well yeah and, absolutely yeah because i was a bit overweight before the surgery because i mean they they do tell you to eat as much as you can before the yes, surgery. yeah they want you to be yeah, yeah. Like, have plenty of reserves yes. you're gonna be, yeah. Yeah. yeah so um yeah no afterwards i lost a fair amount of weight and was capable of doing stuff that i i was not beforehand so another blessing to come out of <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I remember I had a teacher say, "You have lost a lot of weight." You're like, "Yeah, it's not a cancer." Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess I, I need to to let them know that not that I don't like telling people that I've had stomach cancer, but I prefer to say that I've got digestive issues mm-hmm. because then if you don't want to sort of go into a conversation about, "Oh, how'd you get cancer?" and oh, you really okay now? Or, conversation. It is yeah. because then you sort of mm. people sort of piques people's curiosity and mm. they want to have a conversation with you so it's more the obviously the the rear end department as well so if i've got a little bit of ibs and i need to kind of leave the room then i need to just sort of say look i may discreetly need to leave the mm. room because unless you know people and you just let it fly and if i've had breakfast and I go off to a yoga class and I've got to be careful about how often I sort of do, your, you know, your downward dogs and, and that sort of stuff because it's quite, ugh. yeah, you don't want to feel nauseous and mm-hmm. you feel that breakfast revisiting if you're upside down for too long. Yeah. Yeah. So that would probably be the, the main things that I would speak to a yoga teacher about. I've definitely found um, since Ran's, you know, whole journey, that long conversation thing, I think in the past I would feel like it was the compassionate thing to do to get all of the information so I don't just brush off what's something that's serious. But like now I am a lot more kind of like, okay, thanks for telling me. Are there any movements that don't feel good in your body at the moment? Are you comfortable to do your own thing or do you want me to, you know, let me know if you want a little bit more guidance from me? And it's like they're here to do the yoga class. Like they've told that story so many times. Right. They don't necessarily want to unpack it all. Right. Yes. Every time. Yes. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, so I do, I do find that and I find that even when you're meeting new people, I just want them to see me as me, whereas a lot of family are sort of like, oh, how are you going? You know, and I'm like, I'm probably healthier than you. Yeah. Yeah, you don't always necessarily want to have that conversation or be identified as your cancer because, you know, oh, oh she's the one that had the cancer, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't want to be that person. I want to be that so much bright spark that, that works, into the room, works into the room and go, because of that, this is what I am now. Mm. Yeah, the cancer didn't define who I was. Mm. So that's, that's a really interesting point you raised because I, I did notice during that part of the process for me, you know, a lot of the things that changed for me were just the way that people treated me. I, I remember one time I was in work, um, just working away shortly after I was diagnosed, and I think in the same day, two different people approached me and they were crying, sort of like, I'm so sorry, and I'm just like, I'm trying to work here. Yeah, <laughs> so that's their stuff? Yeah. Not your stuff, yeah. Yeah, and, um, and yeah, I, I agree with that. You know, people sort of, oh, you know, so how are you? you know, and I was like, yeah, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Mm. And that's I think that's why people, when they see you, they're so surprised. Oh, my God, you look so well. And it's like, because I am. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So how common is stomach cancer as far as, as, far as we know? So it's the fifth most common cancer type worldwide and the third leading cause of death, um, which is quite interesting and surprises a lot of people because unfortunately for stomach cancer, it, it doesn't get a lot of um, media coverage, mm-hmm. um, unlike a lot of the other cancers. So, but, And unfortunately, then the mortality rate of that is extremely high as well. So there's, you know, it's, as we all know, it's not a great one to be diagnosed with. Is that often because people don't get really obvious symptoms, like, say, a lump they can feel? Yeah, absolutely. And often there's no symptoms, as Michelle can probably um, attest to, or there are common other symptoms like refluxy type things. Mm-hmm. I know with my father, that's pretty much what he had is a refluxy feeling. Mm-hmm. It was sort of brushed off, and then unfortunately, which can happen, he was diagnosed at a very late stage and then was terminal, So, but he would typically say that he really didn't have much warning yeah and I think for for our age I was 39 when I was diagnosed and I had reflux that just increasingly got worse so for a female my age I mean obviously I went to the GP initially and I was put on Nexium Mm -hmm. so look at your diet so you're told look at your diet go on some Nexium see how you go uh, and then, but the the indigestion just got worse and worse and worse to the point where I'm lucky I've got a, had a very proactive GP who said, come on, let's go and have a scope and see what's going on there. And if it hadn't been picked up, it was already six centimetres long behind. It was I had an ulcer in there and there was a tumour behind the ulcer that was six centimetres long. So had I left that for a couple more months just thinking, oh, it's just indigestion, it's, you know, I'll be right, I'll be right, I'll be right. I actually, So that was in the March. I would have literally been dead by Christmas mm. if I had have left that because by the time I went into surgery, which was in July, the cancer had gone into the spleen and also part of my pancreas. Wow. So that was March, June, July. It's like two months, yeah. two months yeah. after. And I was on chemo to try and shrink the tumour at that time. So if I had made that decision in July to go and had start having you know all this exploratory stuff, it would have the cancer would have metastasized to the point where I may not have actually survived. And even my oncologist, I said, I know I was very lucky and you know fortunate that that it was caught when it when it was. Mm-hmm. And he said to me at, at last visit that he was very unsure as to whether I was actually going to survive it. Mm-hmm. And this was my oncologist. <laughs> That's not what you want to hear from your oncologist. Well, seven years later, it's yeah. fine. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me that. But, they, but nobody ever told yeah. me what stage my cancer was at. I didn't know whether it was stage yeah. three, stage like 3B, mm. stage four. I, I, just, I didn't know, but I didn't want to know. Mm. Because the first thing you do is go to Google. Stomach cancer, Google. Ah, okay, that's a really high mortality rate. Yeah. Mm. Ah. And then I had no one to talk to. I spoke to the oncologist and he said, oh, look, he would go to his board of oncologists that he meets with to see whether they knew anyone that I could contact with that had stomach cancer. I spoke to my surgeon and he said, oh, yeah, I did somebody last week. I'm like, would they, you know, would they be willing to talk to me? Like, I need to know someone that survived this. Mm. I don't know anyone that survived this. And that's what was really, really important for me to start um, support group on Facebook because 
I didn't want I didn't want anybody to be in the position that I was in where I thought I have got no one to talk to about this. Mm. I felt so alone. And um, I think Simone and I met on Brett's Facebook page. Remember Brett? He, he yes. passed away. Yes. But Brett was um, associated with uh, No Stomach for Cancer as well. And, I, and that's how Simone and I connected. So it was, it was through Brett's journey that I met a lot of people initially because I, I went searching. I thought, oh, my God, I've got to find someone that's living with this or has mm. had the surgery and has survived. I need hope. I've got two little kids. I need hope. That was part of my reason for putting those videos together that you've seen. I just, and I was sort of... You know, like we've talked about before, there's people just sort of sometimes they'll see the worst when they look online. So I just sort of wanted to be like, well, you know, I'm doing all right. Like, yeah, exactly. The same thing with having you guys speak as well. So, yeah, and I'm really glad that we can do this. But, yeah, um, I, I sort of remember from my journey as well, and I'm tired of using that word journey. <laughs> <laughs> Adventure. Adventure. Evolution. Yeah. 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 Basically, I just had stomach discomfort for a few months, and I actually went to one GP. I'd passed out. I'd, I'd woken up on the bathroom floor when I got off the toilet one time. I went to the doctor. I was freaked out, as you can imagine. And the doctor more or less said, oh, this is normal. This is fine. He just totally brushed yeah. it off. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And that actually put me off going to a doctor for a while. Yeah, I was like, come to my doctor. <laughs> She's yeah. really nice. <laughs> yeah. So I went to... Um, Joe's doctor and she was absolutely lovely uh, treated me for helicobacter first and uh, they actually turned up positive so I got treatment for that but that didn't do anything um, she put me through a few more tests and they all turned out negative so she eventually referred to me onto a gastroenterologist he uh, got me to have a colonoscopy and endoscopy and that's when they found the tumour and by then I think it was about 7 by 10 centimetres and I was looking up words on Google like (laughs) necrotizing. Um, (laughs) And uh, well actually, and this is also a bit disturbing, one one thing from before the surgery was that um, I had really foul smelling burps. I was the same. Yeah, Yeah, it was like sulphur. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I farted once. I farted. (laughs) I burped once in the doctor's surgery and Mm. my little three-year-old was like, oh, geez, mummy, your breast smells like a fart. (laughs) <laughs> and, and that was the same thing that was a big indicator for me yeah, right. so, did yeah. you have an ulcer as well It was. I think the thing was ulcerated and right. yeah it was just a mess down there So, but that is really um, it is a bit scary in terms of some of the lack of knowledge that GPs <laughs> have um, I know in our family experience my dad was one of five dad had passed away another brother had, had stomach cancer and survived and a third brother was feeling symptoms, went to the GP, and they brushed it off. Now, he'd already had two brothers. There was no alarm bells going off here. And he said, no, I'm really feeling... He wrote him a script to go and see a psychologist because he said, I'm sorry, but it's all in your head. Wow. Six wow. months later, he was dead. Wow. You know, and that's really... That's unacceptable, especially when, you know, there should be more exploring. Um, I mean, in our case, we had the family history there, but... I think, and I guess it is hard for GPs because a lot of people would go in with symptoms and they are just reflux, but you really do hope that I they mean, take no those extra steps. Out. That's like... exactly right. So would you like to tell us about the No Stomach for Cancer organisation and the walk that's coming up? So as I mentioned previously, I, I found No Stomach for Cancer when I found out about our CDH1 diagnosis because, as we've all said, we jump on the internet and try and find things. And I found that they were a great resource. So after my surgery, I was really keen to try and do something to help out and I became an ambassador for them which was setting up a a walk once a year and raising some funds and awareness Um, and Michelle and I actually did the first walk together going back 2012 was our first walk Mm -hmm. and we had a small group of us that walked around and raised some money we then did that on an annual basis and I then took on a role on their board of directors a, a few years after that Um, So what I like about No Stomach for Cancer, they are based in America. However, they do support people worldwide and their mission is to support research and unite the caring power of people worldwide affected by stomach cancer. And so what I've found quite empowering is that funds raised are actually granted out to people. Last year, they actually granted somebody here at Peter Mac, which is Dr. Alex Bazutis, which was great. And we now do the walk here nationally. So we have walk hosts all around the country. This year, the walk's being held on Sunday, November the 18th. And people can go and register. It's a free registration, but any donations and merchandise all goes through to No Stomach for Cancer. 
Um, what does granted out mean? Does that mean that it's actually funding a research project? That's yes, happening? that's right. So researchers will put the applications in for certain projects that they're doing, and and then there's a process of choosing where the funds go to. So this year, or last year, um, two research projects were chosen. And that's what they try and do annually in terms of, but obviously depending on funds coming through. So it's usually around $100,000 a year is, is um, given out in grants. Wow, oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. amazing. And uh, I think this will be my third one uh, coming up. I will Excellent. definitely be there. Joe's coming along this time. That's yeah, right. Make sure her calendar is free. And right. uh, we haven't decided on a date yet, but I think we're planning to have a bit of a yoga class at our studio to help me raise money for it as well. So. Oh, amazing. Yeah, it's yeah. actually the workshop that we're going to be doing. It's called Yoga for Digestive Ease, and it's all the practices that Ran's found really helpful post-surgery, like managing a more sensitive digestive system. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that I really found striking in the research that I was doing is the brain gut connection and the vagus nerve and how a lot of the practices that are really soothing for the digestive system are also really soothing for state of mind as well and I know that the stress and anxiety of diagnosis and treatment is massive for the families and loved ones as well as for the person themselves so we tried to focus on really gentle simple practices that are kind of help to soothe a upset digestive system but also kind of put you into that calm relaxed state of mind which means that the body moves into its rest and digest response and stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system and so they're kind of nice practices for the body as a whole for everyone we try to keep it really simple and really accessible is there anything else you'd like to share well, you've obviously said here that you know, the message that you'd like to share with people that have been diagnosed with cancer. Mm-hmm. I found that when you hear that news, you really need to give yourself and your and your immediate family time to process it before you start telling your extended friends and family. Because like you said, uh, people at work coming up to you and kind of putting their stuff on you especially with like your close friends and stuff you know it's all like oh it's devastating you know and it is it's devastating news when somebody close gets cancer but you've almost got to hold that space for them even when you're in hospital Mm. I limited the amount of visitors that I had in hospital because I thought I can't hold I mean I had tubes hanging out of me everywhere I can't hold that space for people Mm. when they come and visit me so I very limited how many people were actually Um, able to come and see me in hospital I said look you know I'll see you when I get home or the other thing I needed to do really really quickly was to develop um, a really strong filter and learn to say no my husband was a beautiful guard at the gate Mm -hmm. (laughs) so you know if I needed to rest or I couldn't answer phone calls uh, then he was a person that kind of directed traffic Mm -hmm. for me and everybody I suppose there some people have find that they're in a bit of a, a state of Um, helplessness Mm -hmm. and that's uncomfortable to be in and so they offer their gratitude or you know you should be oh oh you know you'll be right you'll be right you'll get through this and it's like well I don't actually know if I'm going to get through this and or here read this or Mm -hmm. go here and um, just a a really really uh, quick example I had a, a good friend who directed me to a naturopath and um and I rang her and I just said, oh, look, I've been diagnosed with stomach cancer. I really would like to take a holistic approach to my healing. I'm happy to, to work with a naturopath. And um, and she actually sort of brushed me off. She said, oh, are you having chemo and surgery? And I said, well, yes. She said, oh, well, I can't help you. You've already chosen You've already chosen the, wow. the chemo pathway. Right. And, um, oh, and I'm really busy, so I wouldn't be able to get in to see you for like, you know, and she was sort of flicking through, no ego there at all. But for someone who's in such an incredibly vulnerable position to be told that from somebody when you're trying to reach out, that was just devastating mm-hmm. for me. So you don't have to take on everybody's advice and everybody's opinion because everybody knows somebody who's had cancer, but unless they've actually experienced it themselves and gone through it, they know the process, mm-hmm. then, you know, that's nice. Just say thank you and leave it at that. But don't take on everybody's stuff because you are you are so vulnerable at that particular time that you've really got to be conscious of who you allow into your space. We found it really useful. We set up a sort of Facebook group. Yes. And that was a really good way to just sort of like 
this is the information I have to share. Yes. It's it's called, so uh, if they want to leave yeah. the group, they can. If it's too much for them, they it's can. Yeah. If they want to respond, yeah. they can. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I didn't have to sort of say the same story many, yes. many times. And, and another thing is it was a way for people to sort of offer help and things like that. And another thing, the amount of unsolicited advice you get yes. is, is quite overwhelming. Yeah, and it can we're, be. We were lucky to have a friend, Nellie, who's also a naturopath, but a good one. And she was sort of my gatekeeper, if that makes sense. So yeah. if people offered any suggestions. And there's, you know, there's lots of good stuff, but I think there's a lot of conspiracy theory stuff around cancer as well. And so it was really good to say to people, send this on to Nellie and she can have a look. And Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah, you do. You kind of need that buffer, don't you? Because you really need to, again, be your own advocate mm. and... You've got to do what works for you. So I believe all healing is divine. It doesn't matter where it comes from. And at the time, my oncologist said, look, I don't know about, like there were certain vitamins and things that he suggested that I don't take when I was having chemo. Mm -hmm. But he said, as far as all of the other stuff, he said, I'm not educated in that. So I don't, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So it was about sort of finding. So I went, okay, this is what I'm going to do for the time that I'm going through this. And then once I finish with the oncologist, bang, Mm. I'll go off and do my natural stuff. Mm. Yeah, which is basically what I did. Yeah, Nelly suggested a bunch of supplements and we uh, sent them on to the chemist at Peter Mag. And they were like, no, 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 yes. (laughs) (laughs) So, yeah, we went with that, obviously. And um, actually the supplements that Ran's still taking you know, since surgery, like, you really feel the difference, right? Mm, yeah, just in the last couple of days. If I if I sort of forget for a few days, mm. I notice my energy levels are way different. I haven't ever come off my supplements, so I couldn't tell you. <laughs> I've never come off them. I'm so regimented. And I guess that is something that people might not be aware of. Your stomach is responsible for taking in certain nutrients like mm. iron and B12. Oh, and yeah. so if you don't have a stomach... That is just something that you're going to have to work with for the rest of your life to mm. just make sure that your body gets the nutrients that it needs. So, and I don't think people understand that too. You live with this condition every day, so it's not like you've had your surgery and it's over. Mm. You've got to live with this and you've got to manage it every day. Mm. So I think we are our own worst enemies and our minds are so busy that we've you know got so much going on ourselves that we don't need other people's or do we don't need to take on other people's stuff as well. I think it's that thing as well when you look well and you feel well you can sometimes not be as diligent on the, the supplements and the get, yeah. making sure you get enough rest and the eating really well and it just catches up with you so much faster. The rest is the thing with me, I think, because mm. I want to try and fit so much into a mm. day. <laughs> I don't, and I don't know whether that's just because of this renewed, you know, oh, my God, I, I really need to make, make the most, make of, the most of my life, you know. Mm-hmm. So I just try and squeeze so much in. You feel like yeah. Wonder Woman and then you're just <laughs> 5 o'clock, you're on the couch going yes. to <laughs> a couple of cents together. <laughs> I just want to say thank you to both of you because I think it's amazing what you're doing and as you said I think it's a lot of people hear those you know sad and negative stories and I think this is a wonderful way to give people some hope and let them know that despite challenges you know there's positivity out there so thanks for the opportunity. Thank you you for everything that you do as well and we'll definitely put some links to the different support services for people who've been yes. diagnosed and their Perhaps families. I can give you a link if people want to register for the walk as oh, well. Oh, yeah. yes. Put that, that in for sure. Fantastic. Excellent. And Great. we haven't spoken about Simone's little foundation, so I think that's really important <laughs> to as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, just very quickly, yes. Um, there's something else that I set up after my diagnosis was Family Ties Foundation, which is just to help people have conversations. This is more around genetics. So if you've got a genetic risk within the family, it's often really hard to have those conversations with people. So I set up a resource with the help of some genetic counsellors on some fact sheets and things to help people be able to have those conversations, which resulted from me you know, having to have those, those with my own children and whatnot. So um, I'm happy to send a link to that as well if anyone yeah, needs that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. Well, thank you again so much for your time and um, your wise words. So I'm sure this will be... An absolutely fantastic episode. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so I hope you enjoyed this conversation. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is deeply important to me for obvious reasons. And I think that the work that both Michelle and Simone are doing is necessary and fantastic. If you agree, why don't you drop us a line? We'd absolutely love to hear from you. Come and join our Facebook group, the Flow Artist Podcast Community. Or say hi on our website at podcast.flowartist.com. 
For our next episode, we have an interview with yoga teacher Mei Lai Swan. Mei Lai Swan is a yoga teacher and the creator of Yoga for Humankind. It's a great interview and we hear all about her background as a social worker, a musician, and the work she's doing now in sharing her trauma-informed approach to yoga with the world. We're back to a fortnightly schedule after this episode, so look out for that in two weeks. As always, our theme song is Baby Robots by Go Soul and used with permission. Get his music from gosoul.bandcamp.com. Thanks so much for listening. Aroha nui. Big, big love.